So today we gather for a Lenten service. We're moving along towards Easter. Uh, we will unfortunately not be having Easter egg hunts or any of that stuff this year. There will be some around, but we just don't feel comfortable with the people we would have to put it on are in the high risk category and the people that yeah, we just it's just not we're not gonna be able to do it yet this year. But maybe next. Uh, we do have some people going to summer camp and we're excited about that. And we'll tell you guys that are going what we're gonna be able to do to help you after the board meeting next Sunday, so we'll know. So if you want to be here for that, blessed Brent, the board meeting will be at two next Sunday afternoon. Uh, next week is the time change. It doesn't affect our Saturday crew at all, but it will affect y'all. Um, you don't want to be one of those hard persons that shows up either, whatever it is, an hour early or late. I, I can't keep track. Um, always worries me about daylight savings time because the crops and stuff get too much sun during the summer. But uh, anyway. We lose an hour. It's the same amount of sun? Really? Oh, okay. I don't understand why we have daylight savings time. Are y'all? No. <laughs> Does it really save any daylight? I, I don't get it. Anyway, so we are ready to start worship. Uh, Ann came bouncing in today, so I know she's already been playing some uplifting music. Would you play something to warm our hearts as we begin our worship service? things. We will be doing communion in a little while and I would ask when you're moving around you continue to wear your mask when you're in the line and coming up here. Other than that and then now I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to do a call to worship and then we're going to sing and if you want to if you're sitting you don't need to worry about it. If you're going to stand put on your mask and uh, join it together. The words I believe are on the screen. In your wisdom O God you call us here to worship you. We get our life to worship God. You call us to be fully alive with your life abundant, ready to listen and respond with heart, soul, strength, and mind. We listen alive to the word of God. You call us to be always watchful for your word of wisdom, sometimes startling and unexpected, sometimes still and quiet, but always dwelling among us. We watch and wait for the word of God. And now let's join together and sing, Come ye sinners. Thank you. 
you may be seated. <coughs> Our first scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians. It's in the first chapter. It begins with verse 18. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. We proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Now you may remain seated as we sing. Again, if you're singing, keep your mask on. What a friend we have in Jesus. tradition to serve the Lord's table on the first Sunday of every month. And in the United Methodist Church, the holy the, the celebration of the Lord's table is available to everyone in the room. We don't ask for membership cards or baptismal certificates. We invite you to come. The only thing we ask you to do is to answer the invitation and then to pray a prayer of forgiveness that we will do together. Christ our Lord invites us to this table. All that love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. God longs for honesty in us. Even though our culture seems to avoid talk of sin and confession, our relationship with God cannot flourish unless we freely and honestly express all the facets of our lives, our hopes, our fears, our sins, our desires, thanksgiving, and praise together. Gracious God, our, our sins, sins are, too are too heavy to carry, carry too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, 
and who has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Amen. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Our scripture reading this morning for the, for the gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John. If you're able, would you please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, The temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you, take, will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. These two scriptures fit together in amazing ways for me. I think uh, last night I spoke about God's foolishness. The foolishness, if you will, of the cross. The foolishness of wisdom. Uh, we live in a world where there seems to be some thought that we can solve all of our own problems if we just get enough wisdom. I reflected last night, and I will again this morning, that as I was going through my time in recovery, there was uh, there were some issues I had with the whole recovery system that said, uh, you know, the first step says I was powerless over alcohol. And for me, I was thinking, well, I wasn't that powerless. I knew where to get it. I knew what to do when I drank it. Knew what not to do when I drive, not that powerless. It wasn't the alcohol, it was a stumbling block for me because it wasn't the alcohol that was the problem, it was my life around the alcohol that was the problem. It was the places I went, the people I hung out with, the stuff I did, the goals I set. And there is no amount of intellectual information I can give you that will bring you closer to Christ. It's going to require something in your heart. I watched a movie this morning. I've seen it before. Some of you probably have seen it. It's The Legend of Bagger Vance. It's a Gotham movie. Will Smith plays Bagger Vance. He's a, a caddy for this guy. For uh, I can't even think of his name right this minute, but for the actor. And the guy has apparently lost his swing. And so he's not playing. He's not doing the stuff he was doing. And, and so Bagger Vance tells him, that you have to let go of all of the earthly stuff and become a part of the game. And he was playing in a tournament, Bobby Jones, probably the greatest golfer of all time in this movie. Guy never turned pro. I don't know that he ever lost a tournament. Just an amazing guy. But you could watch him. He was, Bagger Vance was having, look at the guy, look how intense he is. He, he's looking at the field. And I think what Paul's trying to get us to understand in this scripture about, and from Corinthians is we need to look at the field. We need to be looking further than where, what's right in front of us. We want immediate saving, right? That's what we're, God, get me out of this dilemma. Please make the pandemic end. God, let the stock market go up. Let my lights come back on at the church. I mean, those are the kind of prayers that we say we're seldom praying for God's kingdom to come on earth the way it is in heaven. In other words, we're not looking at the big picture, God's picture. We're looking at our picture. 
And that seek, seeking for knowledge and wisdom, it will be our end if we don't watch it. Well, the same thing happens in the Gospel of John. You'll notice that Jesus says, destroy the temple and I'll restore it in three days. And the Jews immediately respond with the legalistic response. What do you mean? It took 40 years plus to build this thing. You're not going to tear it down and build it back in three days. He's not talking about that. And it's not until he dies and is, is resurrected that the disciples get it. Now, friends, we're living on the other side of that. Jesus has died. He has been resurrected. We ought to be able to get it. But yet, we're still looking for signs. We're still looking for wisdom. Oh, God, if you'll just show me, if I'm supposed to be at church today, I'll be able to find my keys. <laughs> And, you know, I feel a little bit like that about this whole, this whole frozen thought that happened. You know, we're blaming the power companies, right? I mean, everybody's blaming the power companies. But I believe, if, if y'all stand, correct me if I'm wrong, the same people that were telling them we were going to have five days of freezing weather, weren't they telling us that too? You know, why do we wait until it really happens <laughs> and it's 20 degrees outside and we don't have any lights to go worry about buying water? And what it creates is a huge problem if you went to the grocery store and looked like a war zone. We had time to prepare. Early in my life when my first son was born, which was 1970-something, what year was it, Kathy? She wasn't there, but, but she knows. <laughs> she was only in high school then. No, uh, but uh, in 77. When he was born, I worked for a company where we had the maternity insurance we had was like $250. That's it. And so I was complaining about that to somebody. And this, this old uncle of mine said, well, let me explain this to you. When you find out you're going to have a baby, most people have roughly nine months to prepare. <laughs> I mean, it's not like God just pops a baby on you tomorrow. Thank goodness. Well, what do we do? We don't really prepare. We just sit around and say, well, I hope we'll work out. I, when I was a commissioned sales guy, I can't tell you the number of times I went in to see the boss on the last day of the month and said, hey, boss, I don't have enough money to pay my bills. And he said, yeah, I should have thought of that on the first of the month. We're, we're focused on just what's immediately right in front of us. And this scripture points that out. And, and what do you think was happening in the, in the temple? Uh, Kathy, many years ago, when we usually try to take an anniversary trip around the first of the year, and we went to, to New Orleans. New Orleans is a wonderful place. I love New Orleans. I love the smell of, of French coffee in the mornings. I just love everything about the French Quarter. And I know you're thinking, preacher, that's a despicable place. I love it there. <laughs> I mean, I would go every week if I could. And, and, and we go to the, to the Jackson Square, to the big Catholic church. You know, it's prominent. It's right there in the middle of the square. And, and we go peek in the door, and they were having a mass or a wedding or something. We didn't get to go in. I wasn't a preacher yet. But we were, we were looking in there, and we walked outside, and all around the outside, they're selling rosary beads and tarot cards and uh, I, you name it. They're selling them. And it just immediately reminded me of this, where, where the temple is a place where people go, and so the world then comes in and says, well, let's make money on it. And we've done that to the church. The church in many places, not here so much, except for the wonderful music from Ann and AJ, it's really not much of a production. You know, we come here and we just worship together. But I can tell you, you can get in the car and drive to some. You can watch them on TV. Or it's like going to a Broadway play to do church. I don't think Jesus cares at all about that. Nope. I think what Jesus cares about is what are you doing to make God's kingdom come about on earth the way it is in heaven? Amen. And so then as I read this scripture early in the week, and I even talked about it on one of the devotionals, I began to think of how many times somebody told me something Sometimes my parents, other people, they told me things that at the time seemed absolutely ridiculous. And as in reflection, as I looked back, I thought, man, that was wisdom. Well, that's the way we get the whole Christian story, isn't it? This didn't happen yesterday. The New Testament's really old. If we were going to be more accurate, we would call it the Hebrew Scriptures and the Apostolic Writings. 
Because new to us means like that new car sitting out in the driveway. It doesn't mean something that was written 2,000 years ago. The apostolic writings can tell us the story of Jesus Christ. They tell us about his struggles. And the Old Testament leads us to understand why Jesus came. Because we could not, we people, humanity, could not grasp the notion of a God they couldn't touch or see. It's not like God made a mistake. God was trying. He did everything you could imagine. They had a pillar of fire when they were in the wilderness. They had a cloud telling them when to stay where they were. They had prophets that did things. Elijah brought people back from the dead. There was all kind of God stuff going on. But nobody was listening. And so I entitled this message today, Can You Hear Me Now? Actually, it just says, Can You Hear Me? And I wonder sometimes if God doesn't sit wherever God sits and think, are they tuned in at all? Because the humanity that I see, and I'm sure you do too as we watch the news and we do the other things, is a group of people that are, they have animus and angst and hostility toward each other. Even within sects and groups, there's hostility. Oh yeah, we can get even to the Methodist world. We can find some. And what attracted me to stay in the Methodist church as I grew up and got older was the fact that in the Methodist church we didn't do some of that stuff in those days. It was the widest, most open doorway into the Christian family of all the denominations. And in some ways... It's the largest non-denominational denomination that there is. And I say that because if you were baptized in a Catholic church, Pentecostal church, Baptist church, Episcopal faith, Lutheran church, whatever, your baptism is good here. The scriptures clearly say to us, one baptism for the remission of sins. Amen. You don't need to be re-baptized. Now, you may need to remember your baptism. You may need to recall what it said, somebody said around you, for you, or with you, because it doesn't matter which of those denominations you got it in, basically what's happening is you were supposed to be at least a uh, 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 testimony, testimony of your actions. You were supposed to be renouncing the evil forces of wickedness or sin and embracing the power that Jesus Christ gives you to overcome sin. That's what baptism's about. Is it required to be saved? No. Is it a public profession to your faith? Yes. Is it useful in life-changing experiences? Of course. Because if we mean it and we say it and we live it and we don't ever say it out loud, is it even real? Reflecting on my recovery time, there's a step in there where we're supposed to take a, a fearless and moral inventory. You know what that means? That means you look at all the dirt. The stuff you did. The stuff we talk about sometimes. Remember when? You know? We say those things. And, and then we, we realize that those things are no longer holding us in their grasp. The song, Amazing Grace. We all know it. We sing it. At least everybody knows the first verse. Most people know the first and last. A few years ago, Chris Tomlin added a chorus to it. It really makes it a better hymn. Some of you are going, no, it couldn't be better. It is better. It's, you know, it's amazing grace. How's it going? Y'all know the words. How sweet the sound. How great the sound. How sweet the sound. To save the wretch once more. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. When we've been there 10,000 years, right shining as the sun, we've no less days to count our praise than when we first begun. And then Chris Tomlin adds a chorus. It says, my chains are gone. I've been set free. My Lord, my God has rescued me. That's what we need to get from the gospel. None of us deserve it. But it's available to everybody. Now that's not the way the world does business, is it? That's exactly why Paul says this is foolishness to the world. The world does stuff where there's you, you do and you get. 
And the church gets there sometimes too. I remember years ago we started, we, we in, in combination with the YMCA started an after school program here at Hope. It was Golden Acres then. And some of the board members said, well, okay, so they're going to use our building. They're probably going to break stuff and tear it up. How many of them are going to join the church? I said, probably not. Probably not one. Then why would we do it? That's not just our church. That's the big C church. That's the church that says, you owe us something. Let me tell you, friends, I love our blessing box. I think it's one of the most incredible ministries that now I didn't pick it up. One of our neighbor preachers thought it up, but, but we we're doing it. And I think it's, we, we, me and Ron and Harry and some other people built that box together and we stuck it out there and we were all pretty cynical. We thought that in a week or so, it would be gone, torn up. Now we glued it down. <laughs> they would have to make some effort to take it. And we thought at that time, well, what would happen is that somebody would just clean it out. And there are days when that happens. But there are also days when mysteriously people drive up that I don't know, I've never met, never seen before, and they pull their car up and they open the trunk and they fill it up. People that don't have anything to do with our church are helping us to help the community which is why I think God called somebody, a group of people, to put a church on this corner in 1937. And I don't think the need's gone away, do you? Now, churches get into this trap, you know. Well, look, why don't we move where the money is? Why don't we move? You know what? It, Pasadena's not so big that you can't drive here from anywhere in town in about 10 minutes on Sunday morning. It's just not that big. We're not that hard to find. I wish we were currently experiencing more parking problems, but I think when the pandemic's over, we'll get back to having that issue to deal with. And, you know, God works in God's ways, right? The, the pandemic caused us to have some time to take care of getting the pews that were literally, and nobody believed this until we started tearing them out. They had been patched and screwed on the bottom. They were falling apart. They were hard to social distance in. They were uncomfortable. And they were not very good. And had we known this was going to last as long as it did, we'd have probably done it back in March. But anyway, we got that done. We got some new carpet. We got stuff fixed up. We're And, and when the pandemic's over, these will be a little closer together. So I hate it right now. When I stand up, I like to lean on the pew in front of me to sing. <laughs> and, and you can't reach it here because we need to be six foot apart. But, but we've been positioned to do stuff to have the ability to be whatever that is. To be something different, something new in this community that's free. We don't charge the community to be here. And we get community help from people that we don't know. The lights would not have been on this morning as soon as they were if it wasn't been for our neighbor down the road. That as soon as it happened, got busy and called them in. This whole notion of, of God's call on our lives is really one of those things that, that we have to try to hear, and I don't know how to tune out the world some days. Some days the world is just so loud. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The pressure from the world to be a certain way, to dress a certain way, to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to use a certain kind of language. And we at the church, boy, we've been really guilty. We put signs up. We tell people, oh, uh, just stop off in the narthex. Well, that's fine if you grew up in church. You might know the narthex is the entrance or the vestibule or the beginning of the getting in, but a lot of people say, what in the world is the narthex? And then that thing out there that you park under, you know, or that you can drive through, that really is a portico But you know, who in the Pasadena, Texas doesn't call it a carpool? <laughs> And Vacation Bible School, you'll see them now. They'll start popping up as it gets to be close to summer. There'll be signs all over town that say VBS. But if you're a Christian and you're a church goer, you know that stands for Vacation Bible School. But if you're not, the ones we want to reach, we're using a language that excludes them from hearing it. Yeah, it costs more to make a sign that says Vacation Bible School. It's a little effort that it requires. You know, I try my best to use words like lobby and carport. I mean, you know, I, I don't know 
know, I mean, I know what those words mean. I can use all kinds of words that nobody knows, but is that called communication? John Shelby Spong said about now, about 20 years ago, he said, if you continue to preach the talking to preachers, if you continue to preach the gospel the way you have for the last 50 years, in 10 years, nobody will hear it. And a lot of people thought, this guy is a heretic. He's, he's wrong. He's evil. He wasn't suggesting that we change the gospel message. He was suggesting that we find new ways to talk about it. I don't like to read from the King James Bible. It's not a bad Bible. I just don't like to read in Old English. <laughs> we were in England. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed some days. I'm thinking, oh, they're reading... <laughs> They're reading from the King James. No, they were reading from the same version I do. Everybody in England has a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the King James when they read it. You know, I, I think sometimes we just get into this whole deal where we think, I, I, I'm telling too many stories of myself. I remember my cousin. She's a year and a month older than me. She, her daddy worked for Mobile Oil in Venezuela. And so they would come home every summer for three months. And I remember Peggy getting off the airplane carrying a little portable TV, which, you know, I'm talking, I was probably 10, so this is 1961. Not many people had one you could carry in your hand. And, and she's carrying this TV, and she said, I said, where'd you get that? She said, I brought it from Venezuela. And I said, well, what good is it going to do you here? She said, what do you mean? I said, didn't they go to speak Spanish? <laughs> I mean, really, we live in this, this eye-centered, I'm thinking about me world. At least I do some of the time. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one. And to do, to do a spiritual thing, to sit back and say, wait a minute, let me see if I can connect with this holy God to see what God's plans for me requires somehow to tune out, to get some of those Bose headphones that are noise-canceling, at least figuratively, to cancel out the noise of the world. We're, we're hearing all this other stuff. It, God's not concerned with whether you have a lot of money in your 401k. In fact, probably some of the people with the least money in their 401k are serving God with the greatest. In fact, Jesus even talks about that when he talks about the widow's might. She gave all she had. For years and years, as a commissioned salesperson, the preacher would come around and talk to me or my family and say, you know, we're doing a pledge campaign. We need to figure out how to do a budget. And I'd say, oh, man, preacher, I work. I'm a commissioned salesman. I never know. We already told you I wasn't planning very well. I made it through the month with not enough money. I, I don't know how I can make a pledge to you, to God, and not live up to it because I won't know how much money I'm going to make. And it was not until Kathy and I were married that we went through the process of understanding that's not how it works. When you put God first, then God starts to have an impact on your schedule, your plan, and the other things you do. I'm not telling you that if you give to God, you'll get more money, but I'm telling you if you, if you put God first in your life, and that includes your, your treasure, your, your time, and your talent, everything about you, when you put God first, your life will be better. The blessings come and you don't know where to get them. You don't even know what to do with them. So when the Jesus says this thing about the temple, I can just imagine the disciples being right there with the Jews saying, yeah, right. And then he's crucified. It was a horrible experience. We'll talk about it on Holy Thursday. It was an horrible experience for him to be persecuted, to have his friends turn on him, to be left alone. It was horrible. It was a horrible death. I was teaching Sunday school in Deer Park a number of years ago, high school class. We did the Jesus Christ Superstar thing as something to kind of get the kids. It was new then. There's a place in there where they do where Jesus gets whipped. And then that, they have music going and you can hear that whip crack for the 30 times in the cracks. A little girl in the class started sobbing. Never had occurred to her they beat our Lord and Savior like that. With a whip. 
Oh, we know about the crown of thorns, and we know about the shame. But he was also brutalized. Made to carry his cross, and then nailed to it. It was painful. And when he came back from the dead, the disciples got it. And from that, the church is born. Jesus didn't come to start a new faith or a new denomination, but it's from that experience of Jesus dying and the tomb being empty and the stone rolled away and Jesus coming back and eating and taking dinner with them and being a part of relationships with them, they began to catch on. And that was the thing that started. That was the witness that happens in this book that got us to where we are and it's going to require our witness from this book now to get those people that don't know they even need or want to be here into a church. Not necessarily this one, any church. We're called. And the question I have for you, I want it to maybe even just bother you a little bit. Can you hear God calling? And sometimes, sometimes, we need one of those things like that. You know, you hook it on your ear. And we need to aim it. Because we've got to get away from the clutter of the world and aim it towards God. And that's what Lent is about. It's repent. Turn. Santana said, you got to stop your evil ways. That was a song. <laughs> it was a cute song, too. I can't, the verse 2 doesn't really work for the church. But verse 1 was. And, and, and you got to stop your evil ways. So, number one, friends, this is the first point. You got to know you have some evil ways. You got sin in your life. Number two, you got to name it. And number three, you got to let go and let God. And when you do, you'll be freed up from the noise of the world. And you'll be given the power. It's promised at your baptism to overcome evil, to confront it, to push it away. And to live, a life, to live a life of righteousness. It won't be perfect. But we have to believe it can be. We have to have a goal. We can get that close to Jesus. We can see through Jesus' eyes. We can be the heart and hands and feet of Jesus Christ. With God's help. Every one of us that's been ordained elder in the United Methodist Church have to stand up in front of the conference. The bishop says, do you, be, do, you be, do you believe you can be made perfect in this life? And the answer is always with Christ's help. Always with Christ's help. Can you hear me? That's what God says. You know, we're about to be in spring. We saw this place looked like a desert. Dead plants brown everywhere and now it's going to start turning green and it's going to happen at roughly the same time that Easter comes it's going to remind us that God still is the one that spins the earth that moves it through the universe and that God is the one that will lead us into life eternal in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen. Uh, today um, every when we come to communion, we always have a special offering. On Saturday nights, and sometimes on Sunday, we have that offering bucket there for the uh, for Emily Everett, our missionary. Uh, but today is we used to know it as one great hour of sharing. It's Umcor Sunday or Umcor weekend. And for those of you who don't know what Umcor is, it's the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Uh, we are a, it's a worldwide rescue plan put on by our apportionments and funds that we collect in this way. After Ike, after Rita and Katrina, after Harvey, the United Methodist Committee on Relief set up stations and we're helping in ways that you can't even imagine. Helping people plan through getting FEMA, helping people get money. In some cases where there was no FEMA or no money, they were actually performing repairs. It's a phenomenal thing that the UMCOR has done over the years. They're not always the first ones there because we're Methodists. We're methodical about what we do, but they're nearly always the last ones to leave. We still have people being helped over around Jasper and that part of the world, way back from the Rita thing where people were left, the government left, everybody else left, but we've still got UMCOR people helping. And now we have a new thing. 
you know, there's people with water pipes broken and not water to drink and I'm for a response to that. And so today as you come to, this is not the regular offering, it's in the back because we don't pass an offering plate right now, but as you come to communion, if you have any spirit change, um, then we can send that to UMCOR as our special Sunday this month to donate to them to uh, keep the world turning. It's one of the things I'm most proud of the Methodist Church about is the ways we involve ourselves in the community. Uh, whether it's educationally with schools like SMU and other schools that we make to help people get educated. It's about hospitals like, you know, of course everybody knows about Methodist Hospital in Houston. And uh, it's about the things we do outside of just church that make us feel connected to the community. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them up, up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give us thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waves, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on the earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, on your holy mountain, he heard your still, small voice. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness. Where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life. Presented him alive to the apostles during the 40 days and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now when your people prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted in grace to reaffirm the covenant you made through Jesus Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ, Christ is dying, Christ, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So again, if you as you come to the table, if you would wear your mask, uh, Anne's going to play something pretty for us for our time. If you would try to stay, uh, and, and family groups are fine together, but try to stay distanced.
Uh, the table's prepared. You're free to come.
Friends, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. We've been to God's table. It's only a glimpse of what's to come. And God continues to echo that question. Can you hear me? Well, as we close out our service today, uh, you know, I always, I, I need to say this, and even though I know there's not anybody here that will respond to it because you're all already done it, but, uh, you know, if this would be the day that you reunite with our church, it's so good to be doing that again. Uh, come forward as we close our service with this last hymn, and it's Holy, 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 one of the greatest hymns in all of will Be standing now, as we gift of his son called Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that guides us through. Go in peace. Amen.